Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is a series and part of uh, our program, Bear in Mind, uh, Mental Wellbeing in the Workplace. Today, our topic is addressing loneliness in the workplace. Before we start, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this possible, Kennebunk Savings, Prime Buckles, The Richards Group, and Full Spectrum Wellness for providing content for this program as well. Um, today, our speaker is Janice Shulin. Um, she is an emotional well-being consultant and the founder of the Shulin Group. She's on a mission to provide equitable access to emotional well-being education to organizations who give a damn about the health and well-being of their workforce through the delivery of human-centered, culturally responsive training, coaching, and consulting. Shulin provides key strategies and effective tools to transform participants to feel liberated, empowered, and joyful around their mental well-being. Uh, Janice holds a master's degree in public health and is a certified health education specialist and leverages her 15 plus years of public health program design and delivery experience. Uh, for her extended bio and contact info, we're going to put a link in the chat. Um, and I will hand it over to Janice. Thank you so much, Dina. Hello, good afternoon to everyone. I want to start off by moving this nice box over here so I can see everyone's faces. And I want to start off by thanking NHBSR for reaching out and asking me and inviting me to come share about an important topic. I also want to thank each of you for coming today to learn more about loneliness and social connection, because if there's one thing that I hope you learn from today is that we can work together to advance social connection and decrease some of the serious effects of loneliness. Before I begin, I just want to get a thumbs up that you can see my screen on the title image. Uh, yes. Not yet. Not yet? Okay, thanks. So let me go ahead and do that. Yes, now we yes. can. Screen. Okay. You. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to begin. We're going to get right into this. Um, Zena gave me a nice introduction, so that was just for more information, but I'd really love to get right into the purpose of why we're here today. And that is we're going to together work on defining loneliness, reviewing myths, which are assumptions that can get perpetuated that create a lot of hesitation or stigma around loneliness and review the health and mental health, physical health impact of loneliness, but then also look at it through the lens of workplace impact. And finally, we will go through and review tips for advancing social connection at work. A little housekeeping for this afternoon's and for this webinar is to please use your virtual hand to raise your hand if you have a question or comment. Or, of course, we open the chat. Zena will be monitoring that. And I really do welcome any comments. And there'll be a couple questions throughout here to boost engagement, but also give you an opportunity to learn more. So let's step back and identify what is the problem. Well, it's for the first time ever, the Surgeon General has issued a publication on loneliness. And this points to the seriousness of the public health issue. However, they also identify that loneliness and isolation are at the core of many health issues that we face as a country. So we'll learn more about that in just a moment. But the problem is that about one in two adults in America reported experiencing loneliness. And I'd like to share a little bit about my experience with loneliness because I can't expect us to share stories if I don't do that myself. And it will also help to share and shed light that loneliness is common. My Looking back and reflecting on my life, I have experienced loneliness because I moved seven times between kindergarten and 12th grade. That's a lot of time. 
And in each place, I had to reset and relearn some social norms and cues from peers. But it was also very challenging because I felt excluded, not knowing what the norms were, or I really wasn't together with this group of friends who have been together since preschool. And then most recently, I experienced loneliness, well, a bout of loneliness, when my family and I decided to move from sunny South Florida to New England. Well, I had a lot of experience with loneliness as a youth, so I knew that I had to be proactive about engaging with my community so that I could, you know, stem off a long experience with loneliness. And that's what I did. I visited my community center, the library, and joined other parent groups that helped me integrate. But I just wanted to share that because it's through experience and practice of loneliness that I've been able to know when I experience it and know to reach out. I also wanted to share it because there is this stigma about loneliness, that if you admit that you're lonely, that there might be a perception that you might be unliked or unloved, which is not true at all. Once you start to understand that loneliness is common and is part of our human experience, we can kind of, we can decrease that pressure and that stigma that we have to suffer alone or that we feel we're the only ones who are going through it. And let's also make a comment that social media also helps us, well, I should say social media also perpetuates the stigma that loneliness isn't an issue because we look at social media as we're scrolling around and we see, oh, everyone's living their best life. Everyone's achieving their goals. I must be the only one who feels this way. And that's not true. So I share my story to share that piece of it, that it's not true. You're not alone if you've ever felt lonely or are currently. And I'd love also for just a minute, if you can put in the chat group, if, if you're coming from your workplace, are you coming be, um, from a position of managing others under you? Or are you here to learn more about loneliness as an individual? I'd love to kind of get a little feedback on that. I see some folks typing. So I'll give a minute while you write that in just one more um, one more topic is that social isolation and loneliness is such an issue that now the World Health Organization has declared <laughs> loneliness as a pressing health threat. And there's a loneliness minister in the UK. So today really is about acknowledging, getting informed and acting. So we have several things in the chat. And we have, we're managing others, want the feel, team to feel connected, both. I'm here as an individual, but hoping to become a manager in the future. So you're trying to prepare for that success and that move. Awesome. Interested because I manage others who work virtually. Great. We're going to talk about remote work environments and how to keep connected. Managing others to get a perspective and experience that may be different from my own. Team of Managing a team of six. I'm here for myself and for others. I recently moved to a field office where I'm away from the main office and I and others in the field may feel lonely. This is great. This is good information because A, we're all sharing that we're all interested and we're all ready to learn and A, acknowledge that there's a part that each of us has in responsibility for ourselves and others when we're, when we're in a management position. So thank you for sharing this. And there's others as well. So I want to ground us first in a definition of loneliness. So to do that, I want to start off. Dr. Vivek Murthy, who is our current U.S. Surgeon General, has a really great approachable definition. And he says that loneliness in its, in its most simple form is that it's the connections you need are greater than the connections you have. So there's a deficit that something you, the connections you need are greater than what you have. And it's a very subjective experience, meaning it's your, everyone has their own experience with loneliness. And I wanna, I've mentioned it before and I wanna reiterate right here that feeling lonely is a part of the human experience. 
we a great way to look at loneliness is looking at your other needs in your life, which is our basic needs are hunger, thirst, shelter, right? So when we're hungry, what does our body do to tell us we're hungry? We'll get stomach pain, right? Our stomach will churn a little bit to signal, hey, I need it. I need you to get some food in me. It's loneliness is also like thirst. When your body is thirsty, what happens? What alarm does it send to your brain? Your mouth might get parched, you might get a headache. And this signals to your body that you need to drink something. Well, the same thing happens with loneliness. Because connection is part of our human experience, when we don't get it, we feel that our needs are unmet, our body signals to us, hey, I need some connection, something's missing. So I want to, I want to frame loneliness as, as A, it's common. It happens to everyone because it's a human experience. Now, what I also want to reiterate is that loneliness is not the same as being alone. There are many people who are surrounded physically by others at work, in the community, or at home, at school. But even though they're around others, they can still feel lonely. So that's a really important misconception that I want to start off with for you to know, is that it's not the same as being alone. And it really is, loneliness is about a feeling. You have this feeling that your needs aren't going to be, aren't going to be met. Your needs are not being met. Now, as I mentioned that some folks will think, well, it's, if you're feeling lonely, a quick fix is to get around a lot of other people. But I wanna also reiterate that it's not about the quantity, it's the quality. It's meaningful interactions that you have with others that can help you feel connected and build your, build your connections so that your needs are met. Loneliness can also be described as a feeling like that you can't be your true self, that you feel others don't see you as who you really are. They don't understand you. That's another way we can describe loneliness and it's an internal state. Now let's, let's make sure that we know that while loneliness and isolation are often paired together, they are different because loneliness, as I mentioned, is an internal state where isolation is completely objective. It's objectively having fewer relationships, group memberships, and infrequent social interaction whereas loneliness is an internal feel that you might have a lot of people around you, but you internally feel that you don't feel understood and your needs aren't being met. One more to, to differentiate here. Solitude is not the same as loneliness. Solitude is a state of aloneness by choice that does not involve the feeling of lonely. How many of us like to have a little solitude time where we might want to Netflix and chill, take a hike alone, get everyone out of the house so we could just relax and do whatever we wanna do. That time to reconnect with yourself is important to our well being, But it's important to know that just because you're spending time with yourself, which is rejuvenated and welcoming, it's very different than loneliness. Do we have any questions so far about these three um, these three terms here? You can pop, pop it in the chat if you do. If not, we'll move on. And I really think it's important to understand that there are three types of loneliness because sometimes it could be hard to understand why the people around you are lonely or why you yourself may be feeling lonely. So a better way to understand is to look at, <clears throat> acknowledge that there are three types of loneliness and that we need all three in order to feel connected. So the first one is missing. 
excuse me, the first one is intimate. This is when you feel like um, a lack of connection with people who know you well, but you don't feel that connection. So this could be best friends, partners, people you confide in that you're missing that connection from those folks. You don't have anyone that you can be vulnerable with, who you can share your highs and lows with. So an intimate connection is a part of loneliness. And if you're missing it, that's when you can experience loneliness. It only takes one of these to be off to experience the feeling that your needs aren't being met. The next one is social. This is when you're missing a circle of friends. You don't feel like you belong to any one group. These are people that you would maybe spend after, after work with, weekends, vacationing with them or watching sports. If your social connections isn't being met, you don't have a group where you can um, share events and moments with, this is another way that loneliness can be experienced. And lastly, we have collective. If you, miss a, if you miss a sense of shared identity and you don't feel like you can connect with anyone in a shared group, like faith group, a volunteer organization, sometimes it can be work if you identify your identity with work. If you don't have any of those missing pieces and you're missing that shared identity, you can start to feel lonely. And remember that loneliness We'll get to this in a minute, but loneliness can be experienced because you're missing, you feel like you're a puzzle piece and you're trying to find where you can fit in, whether it's through faith, best friends, social. Let's talk for a minute now. We're going to, now that we understand what loneliness is, we're going to learn about its individual impact and I want to start off by saying that loneliness is far more than just a bad feeling. It harms both individual and societal health. In fact, loneliness is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. It's even it's even um, been associated that experiencing lo long-term loneliness and lacking that connection can increase the risk of premature death to levels comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now that's just on an individual level. You can see the harmful effects. What about work? What about in our business economy? Well, if prolonged, the, the issues of loneliness can be costly and lead to diminished productivity, physical and emotional stress, which then leads to a withdrawal from the team or absence from work. In fact, stress-related absenteeism attributed to loneliness costs employer in an estimated $154 billion annually. Does that surprise anyone? Is that number... Is it greater than what you would think, lower or just right on? I'm curious. And as we get some folks to type in, just seeing the number there shows you that the lack of social connection can have significant economic costs to both individuals' health and our society. Yeah, surprising but understandable. That's right. Okay, great. Thanks for responding. So here's a little picture, a snapshot to show us a little bit deeper into loneliness in the workplace. The 2023 Work in America survey put on the, by the American Psychological Association showed us that while most workers don't feel lonely while at work, excuse me, while most workers don't have not experienced feelings of loneliness, there is a meaningful 26% who have experienced feelings of loneliness or isolation at work. So as you can see, that number is meaningful. And despite the fact that those workers interact with others frequently, take a look 
that it's the customer, if it's folks who are in customer, client, patient service roles that experience the most feelings of loneliness. And I wonder if that surprises anyone. And it goes back to the issue, well, they're around a lot of people. I would assume that they wouldn't feel lonely, but this snapshot shows us otherwise. Great, yeah, that number is high. So we'll just talk for a minute about loneliness and to kind of put the cherry on top of the information around loneliness that it can be hidden very well. As I mentioned social media before, it can show us that everyone is doing great and there is no signs of loneliness because they're out and about. But remember that we can cover up feelings of loneliness pretty well. We still put on our face, we get out there and we kind of walk the act. But when we go back home, we start to feel really drained and feel like, you know, I talked to 17 people today. I was surrounded by 200. And yet I just felt like no one really understood me. And then feelings of inadequacy can develop as well. So these are some signs of loneliness and they vary from sad to happy to irritable. Because again, that masking can show up as happy, even though internally they're feeling lonely. We're going to review just a few myths here to ground us a little bit further into what is loneliness and its impact. So one myth is, well, I have a lot of online connections. I am able to, um, at one, you know, in one click, I can reach someone across the globe. So I, I don't think I can feel lonely here. I've got my online friends. Well, we need to recognize that humans are wired for social connection. And while technology plays a pivotal role in enhancing the way we work, how we work, and how we solve a lot of problems, in regards to connection, we have to be very proactive with leveraging technology so that we stay connected. So this goes to the comment earlier about being in a remote environment. How can you still connect with folks who are working remotely? And that is really leveraging what's available so that you can make plans together and look forward to, to things. This is outside of work, but also when using technology at work, using it in ways that you can solve work issues, but also have a space where you can show up as your full human self and talk about things that are currently going on, whether it's high or low. But the idea here is that there is no substitute for in-person interaction. How can we leverage technology to stay connected? Have you ever seen this on LinkedIn where folks will say, wow, we met two years ago on LinkedIn and now we finally met up and it's the best. We're going to start you know, a new endeavor together. And you see that there's some synergy from connecting online, but it's when they meet in person, it's like, oh, we did it. You can really see this boost in, in their connection because they were able to meet in person, although it started online. Another myth that we should review is that who is feeling lonely? A myth is that older generations are the loneliest. Well, we now have evidence that shows it's Gen Z population who are experiencing loneliness. This is the age between 16 to 24. Now, this is important to highlight because this is, these are our rising workers. They are entering the workforce and they, yet they are, they are said to be the loneliest generation. So it really points to the responsibility and agency between all of us to work together to make sure our workplaces are meeting people where they are. And another thing to highlight is that loneliness appears across all age groups. Even though uh, young adults are the ones who experience it the most, that doesn't mean other generations aren't. It's across the board. It also occurs in rural and urban settings as well. And this leads to, well, 
let some people will say, well, let's solve the loneliness problem by requiring everyone to go back to work in person. Now, the truth is loneliness can be experienced even when you're around other people. So it won't saying to just go back to work in person because it will fix the problem doesn't acknowledge the issue that, well, just because you're around other people doesn't mean you won't experience loneliness. So it's really important to note that. And of course, there are pros and cons for being in person or remote. And that's something that we'll get to discuss in each workplace. But acknowledging that loneliness will occur in remote and in-person settings is something to acknowledge and recognize so that you can make advancements for your own workplace. So where do we go from here? This wasn't all sad, bad news. We, we had to first establish the problem and acknowledge that, okay, there are some real health and economic implications to this, but where do we go from here? And that is social connection. Just as I said, hunger and thirst are part of our experience, so is social connection. We are hardwired as human beings to interact with other people. And despite our current ad advancements that now allow us to live without engaging with others a lot, like you know, food delivery, automation, remote entertainment, while that those advances have helped us like make things quicker, we also are losing out on engagement and we have a biological need to connect. Thank you, thank you, Betty. Our relationships and interactions with families, friends and colleagues and neighbors are just some ways that we can create connection. And today I'm gonna make the case for starting small in our own networks. And to start off, I really want to make the case that if we're talking about social connection, we're talking about well-being. And if we're talking about well-being, we're talking about belonging. And I bring this up because the more we connect, the more we feel like we belong. And I'm coming from a place as a you know workplace well-being consultant. And I truly believe that if you want to improve workplace well-being, you have to start with belonging. Belonging is, is, that, is a feeling that you feel valued, heard, and seen at work without fear of being left out. And this can come through in a variety of ways, but belonging means that you feel seen, valued, connected, and proud. But what happens is that many, 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 much of our workforce feels that they have to cover or what's called code switching, where they have to hide parts of their identity to blend in to whatever is the norm. And examples of this can include accents, hair texture, clothes, um, identity roles like parenthood, faith. And what happens is when we start having to create an effort to cover these parts of our identity up because we fear that it will exclude us, it weighs in on mental health. And not only does it have a negative impact for that person, but it also impacts a business. When an employee lacks a sense of belonging, they become increasingly disconnected from their work and colleagues. And what that means is you're not getting the full talent that you, po that you possibly can have because they're feeling less engaged. In contrast though, when employees do feel a sense of belonging at work, even when they are stressed, they tend to feel more supported and engaged. And that reflects in their work. They are more likely to lean in into collaboration and willing to contribute their creative talents. So here's a great snapshot from the same survey. And what we see here is when certain groups feel they do not belong at work, 
well, yeah, when they do not feel like they belong at work, we see that an overwhelming majority of workers said it is very or somewhat important to them that their workplace be a place where they feel like they belong. So most workers think it's important that they that their workplace is a place they feel like they belong. Unfortunately, about 20% strongly or somewhat disagree with the statement, when I'm at work, I feel like I belong. Now, interestingly, only if they broke this down into duties within the organization, and interestingly, you'll see that only 10% of upper management employees did not feel a sense of belonging compared to 19% of individual contributors, 22% of middle management, and 25% of frontline workers. What that means is that there is a discrepancy, right, from the upper management understanding and relating to the lack of belonging felt by a quarter of frontline workers. And it's good to kind of give you the snapshot to highlight and confirm that a sense of belonging fits into well-being, fits into social connection to help us advance out of loneliness. So what do we go from here? And the answer is social connection. That's why we're all here. But I'm gonna pause for a minute because I see someone had a question about, did they break down the results by race, culture, or age, they did, and I can share more about that um, if we have time at the end, but they did. And there is a discrepancy between um, different racial identities. And as you may suspect, those who are, um, who identify more um, with like black, Hispanic, um, black, Hispanic, and other non-white identities experienced more loneliness or answered yes more to this question that when I'm at work, I, I don't feel like, like I belong. So thank you for asking that, Gail. And there is more information online that I can share with you. But I want to get to the heart of this conversation, which is social connection. It can predict better physical and mental health outcomes and ease stress. That's why when you are thinking about the culture of well-being at your work, social connection is a piece of that. Because as you can see, it impacts an individual, but it will also impact their productivity and their willingness to collaborate. So it's really important when we look at social connection that it's a piece of, it's a part of your well-being. Now, before I intro the next slide, I really want to harness the conversation around that social connection a little goes a long way when it comes to advancing social connection. Sometimes we get trapped in our mind of like, it has to look a certain way or we have to roll out this big campaign. But I'm here to affirm that a little goes a long way. And what I mean by that is we can leverage some of the interactions that are already occurring to help us feel more connected. And one of those is mirror neurons in our brain. Have you heard of mirror neurons before? Basically, we all have these neurons that when someone smiles, we can't help but smile also. There, there's these neurons that trigger that smile to, to reflect what we see. And so I wanna do a quick demonstration. I do see that most of us um, have our cameras off, which is fine, but here's another thing that we could do. If you want, you can find someone in the, in the um, videos here who has their camera on and smile at them and see if that brings a boost of well being to you. See if it makes you smile or if not, take a look I have this demonstration where we can look at these smiling faces, concentrate on one box, one, either someone on camera or here. See all the nuances in their face. 
Look at everyone smiling, beautiful smiles. I love it. We got some giggles. I could see it. And that's, that's where I want to start with this social connection is that a simple act of smiling can boost connection. Michelle, I saw you giggling. And so I couldn't help but like giggle back. That's connection. Sheila, I see you grinning on there. We can start small. It's okay. And I love when I'm on a walk and the people I pass smile at me. Yeah, it feels good. It feels like you're seen, right? So Gail, thank you. That's my next point is that even strangers can help us feel less lonely. It's our interactions in everyday life, whether it's at work or at home. It's the small interactions that we have with strangers, with people who are associates or anywhere in between. It's the small acts and simple acts that can help us boost connection. I want to share a story how I, I was getting out of the van on a very windy day. I did not know New Hampshire had all these, this wind sometimes that was so strong getting out with my little three-year-olds. We were getting pushed back from the wind and I'm trying to take little steps. I'm not holding them. They're not in a stroller. We're just kind of corralling to get us through the parking lot. And a big gust of wind comes again and it opens the uh, fence that wraps around the garbage and it whacks against it. And I'm like, whoa, this is almost dangerous. It was that strong. And then I hear a voice say, excuse me, can I help you? And I turned around and it was a lady smiling at me. And I just handed her one of my three-year-olds and I said, can you carry her? And we you know, fought our way through the wind inside and we laughed about that. And it really, it sparked this connection between us. And I share that to, sh to show it could be a small act interaction like that. The next time you're at a doctor's office, nodding to someone or picking up a drink, thinking, hey, my, my coworker might want something. Let me text them. Some simple things like that. I am holding the door open. A lot of this has to do with kindness. Are you seeing a theme between social connection and kindness? And so remember that these brief moments of interaction can go a long way to boost our mood and our feelings of connection. So thank you for participating in that demonstration. Now, we've gotten to the part where we're going to talk about the tips for improving social connection at work. But before I do, I'd love to open the floor if anyone has any thoughts or questions about what we've gone over so far. Janice, do you think that the pandemic had an impact and on our social skills, especially with the young folks that experienced COVID um, and maybe did not develop their social skills in yes. their old age? Great question, Zena. One is, I want to answer it in two parts. One is loneliness was occurring even before the pandemic. There was a rise in loneliness pre-pandemic. When COVID happened, of course, everything got worse because we had to shut in and absolutely no social uh, connection with others in person. And so now we have, we are now, um, you know, establishing our new normal. And we do see evidence that there are groups who missed out on developing some of these social skills and norms. And it's impacting them at school and at home and organizations with missions close to early childhood family engagement are taking on that work to help bridge the gap. And they're working tirelessly and, and doing the best with what they have to help bridge that gap. So yes, it has. And, and as adults too, um, I had mentioned earlier this morning in another meeting I was in that when I first moved here, 
it was still that uh, early stages of the new normal, still very early. And adults, we were sharing with each other, saying like, where, where do, where do we go to meet other parents? You know, like what, what, ha what happened? Like we're all kind of wiping our eyes from the fog. And it led to a really great new group forming. See, that's what can happen with those sparks of connection. People are saying, well, I'm not the only one. Let's, let's work together and create something new, something beautiful that what is doing is creating connection. So great question. So piggybacking off of the a little goes a long way, I want us to remember to think small, feel big. What that means is I would like for you to approach advancing connection with yourself or at work in your community through the lens of taking it small. As I meant, you know, as I said, like we get wrapped up in that we have to create this whole big thing when let's remember that it's it's okay to start small. And as you collect evidence of, oh, that went well. Oh, they they smiled back at me. Oh, I got great feedback from our, our employees who loved that engagement. It's gonna help you motivate you to grow bigger, go bigger as you evolve. And that's okay. So no matter where you are on this journey of social connection, just know starting off small is is go is fine because a little goes a long way. So this is all about social connection and bringing in some of these tips to your workplace is all about improving the potential for connection. Okay? We another thing we get wrapped up in is oh, what if they don't like it? Or what if nobody shows up? Oh, I, I don't want to deal with that. And then we never engage. We never try anything. So I want to ask you to start with curiosity. And you already have evidence that you can step up with curiosity because you're here today. You wanted to learn a little bit more. You want to learn from others. So really lean into your curiosity and maybe start with questions. Curiosity can help, excuse me, good questions can help spur some curiosity. Does my team feel like they can connect beyond work tasks? Am I hearing that feedback in the hallways or on the chat chatter? Have I assessed my employees to, to know if they feel like they belong? Is there a recent example of this that easily comes to mind? And as I go through these examples, I'd love to hear in the chat box what uh, all of you are doing in your current workplace to improve the potential for connection. Big and small, all are welcome. This is the opportunity to share with others. Okay, so uh, we're talking about questions, you know, where are, where is, where are the sources of connection coming from in my workplace? And again, these questions help guide you to figure out where you can start from or where you can grow from because you're really looking at the potential for connection. It's possible that whatever is done isn't going to be 100%. And that's okay. You ha we have to remember we have to meet people where they are and give them a lot of opportunities to try again. Maybe someone's not ready today, but they know, but they know because this is a reoccurring event, they'll, they'll be ready in three months. So we're really thinking about consistency and a variety of ways to interact with our team. A few people have mentioned that a ways I interviewed a few folks in preparation for this webinar, and I had loved to get their feedback. And they said that they schedule connections in meetings. That's where it happens. And some folks will say, that's great. And other folks say, oh, we do our connections outside of meetings, and it has its own designated time. All of it is good. 
But in this particular case, scheduling connections in meetings helped everyone kind of build the camaraderie and the connection first as they before they worked on some of the work tasks. And I'm going to get to everyone's responses. So please keep putting those in there. We have to remember that the future of work has changed. We have remote, hybrid, in-person, and we have to remember that we, if we really care about the well-being of our workforce, of the organization, we have to be adaptable and we have to meet people where they are and have intentionality. And we're going to have another slide with some more specifics, but this is kind of a way to get everyone's mind thinking, oh yeah, I do some of these, or maybe you know this is a good idea. So the weekly interviews is, this came from Dr. Vivek Murthy. This is something he does with his team, that bef before the meeting starts, they pair people to interview each other in front of the group. They interview each other on non-work issues or tasks. It could be something, they spend 10 minutes doing this and each person has five minutes to interview while others listen. You know, what was the, what was your favorite thing you used to do growing up as a kid? What did you dream of doing when you were a child? Are there any current hobbies that you're doing? And all of this conversations that's happening is letting others tune in to see the human side of their coworker. And we've already built up the evidence that if you can do that, if you can create those moments of engagement, that's going to help team members feel engaged and be willing to collaborate and get creative with their tasks. So, and then don't forget about the leveraging leadership and employee training you know, understanding, acknowledging that connection is important, understanding that there are a variety of ways to connect folks remotely and in person. And you're thinking about promoting new ways to learn about each other outside of work. A lot of, you see some companies doing acts of service together. Some, some companies do that because it helps everyone build towards a greater cause. So that's another example of ways to improve potential for connection. And now I'm gonna pop over to the chat and it says, Eugenia says that uh, a kindness champion weekly will, they are referred by others for some small act of kindness they did that week and they got a shout out in a weekly newsletter. So this is highlighting someone that's, that's awesome to highlight someone who did something well or an act of kindness that helps boost connection. I can attest as an EM, as an EMP at a place with weekly supervisory meetings and house meetings, these things change the language of social interactions from lonely and on your own to supportive of your supervisor and peers and the clients living there. So you're you're proving to some um, you're providing testament that starting with connection can change the way you, you talk about social interactions and the way you feel. We've gone in an unfortunate direction here. Most of the connection we are bringing about had fam fairly aggressively stamped out. I would love to get the ball rolling again, but I do wonder how to help bring that connection back and how to help the upper management see that the connection helps everyone. Yes, Alexandra. I don't, I will say confidently, you are not alone, right? She is not alone in helping upper management see that connection helps everyone. And this leads us to this important piece, I thought, to kind of give us a glimpse of what organization, teams, and individuals can do, have a sense of agency when it comes to social connection. So from a bird's eye view or coming from the top down, this is really about creating a culture of connection, culture of well-being, and spending time tying in well-being and connection together, showing that it really does go hand in hand. 
And some of the ways that they can do that is by prioritizing it. Saying out loud, we value our employees and we have our well-being program and we want to make sure that we highlight social connection. And these are the ways that we're going to do it. And so when employees get to see that that's what leadership is talking about, that has that trickle down effect that some of us are sharing as well. You want to, the organization wants to create and foster a culture of connection. What that looks like is saying, yeah, let's do some of these events in the workday. Make it something that um, is inclusive to everyone. So everyone's at work, let's monthly get together and do a virtual game if everyone's remotely or host some kind of interaction engaging event. And if you're on the remote side, you know, looking at making sure that if you're on Slack or, or another a software like that, making sure that the channels aren't all about work. That's a really great way to quickly assess what's going on is what are the channels made up of? What are the titles? Are there any social channels available? One person shared that what they really value about their remote culture is that it's social connection is embedded in their everyday, that there are opportunities that they can engage with others monthly, bi-weekly, and then through the chat feature, that she loves the Mac channel because every time something new, a new update comes out, they're chitter-chattering about that. That's connecting folks who are into that one subject to each other. And it helps because when there's a need in the future, you've already spent time on building that relationship. And so that's looking at things from a organizational level. The last bullet you'll see is be proactive. Give a chance, excuse me, not give a chance, but be proactive and get in. Be ready to roll up your sleeves and figure out what are some ways that I can foster connection. Looking at teams, and many of us here have said that we manage teams. Think about leveraging your existing resources. Do you have employee resource groups? Do you have this uh, shout outs and newsletters? Take stock in what you already have and see if there's ways you can leverage that. Be sure that you're also modeling that behavior to your team. Are you giving shout outs? Are you saying how, are you getting to report back to your team? What are the ways that you connected at home and how you can share that at work? And remember, it's all about improving the potential to connect with others. If you are going to, uh, let's see here, Alexandra, you were saying you want to kind of roll this out again. Remember thinking about how keeping it small is okay. A little goes a long way. Assessing what you're doing now so that you know what adjustments you have to make. Then lastly, what are some things as an individual that can we do to help advance social connection while we're at work? One is deepen knowledge about the power of connection. Is there any team members who you think would benefit from, in, from information about loneliness and social connection so that it ties into what, up, what the organization is doing, what teams are doing, and what part that they have? Also as an individual, right? Because we don't take off who we are when we get to work. We have to take stock in what refuels ourselves. What do you enjoy doing? Last week, we talked about joy at work. NHBSR had talked about joy at work. What are some things that you're doing that bring you joy or used to, but you haven't done in a while? We all have a part in advancing social connection. And part of that is doing what refuels you. Of course, we have to say, ask for and accept help knowing that if you're feeling loneliness and it, you're not able to do what you have to do to get out of it, then that's when we need to ask for help or reach out and say, I'm feeling lonely, can we connect? For me, that's my dad. When I'm feeling inadequate or lonely, a quick call to my dad helps me feel rejuvenated and ready to get back at it. 
So we're gonna just review a few key, key takeaways and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. The first is remember that loneliness is a human experience. We don't have to hide that experience from ourselves. We can acknowledge I might be feeling lonely or you can share with others, I am lonely. Can we connect? And this is thinking about your intimate, your social and your collective connections. Remember that this is about meaningful interactions. There's going to be, there are a lot of tips to bring into the workplace, but it's about bringing meaningful interactions, hearing people laugh, nod, or saying, yeah, me too. I used to do that as a kid. That's where social connections count. It has to be authentic. And remembering that we need these three types of connection, intimate, social, and collective. And lastly, we're in this together. We can't advance social connection in the workplace without each other. So we all have a part in it. Take today, take stock in today and, and ask yourself, is there something else I could do? Here are a few quick resources if you wanted to learn more about loneliness and I can share them with Zena and she can send that out to you. But lastly, I wanna say thank you to you all for coming, for learning, and what I hope is to take action toward building connection with your workplace. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We have a couple of minutes uh, if a question, if you would drop it in chat or unmute and ask your question if you want to. Yes. Yes. You're, yes, you're welcome. You're so welcome, everyone, for the information. And I am going to thank you very much, Janice. Uh, I'm going to share a few upcoming events with you. Um, if you want to continue uh, the series, we have a few more events coming up. Um, the next webinar for Bear in Mind is on February 8th, and it's about navigating the mental health system. We have uh, a psychiatrist from uh, Dartmouth Health, uh, Dr. Duncan is actually the clinical director of Integrated Health, and he is uh, a well-renowned expert in the space. We also have our own Deb LeClaire, who's a psychologist and an executive coach. They will talk about the different types of mental health uh, care that you can receive and navigating the system. Um, and then we also have why employers must create uh, caregiver friendly workplaces talk about um, um, the need for flexibility and uh, support for employees who are uh, providing care for loved ones. So that is coming up next week. And we'll put the links to register for those in chat. And we have many other programming, including um, mental health um, training um, and other webinars coming up for creating workplace culture in a remote environment. So I invite you all to visit our website and see what you can um, find and what relates to you. Thank you all for joining us. I wanna thank Janice again for providing her insights and expertise. Uh, I wish you uh, a happy rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.